So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for this Lunch and Learn. Uh, my name is Roxanne Dion Boudreau, and I'm joining you today on behalf of the Champlain Community Support Network, and I will be your moderator for this session. So in January, January is Alzheimer's Awareness Month in Canada. Um, and so the Dementia Society created this event um, to bring more awareness around Alzheimer's disease and related dementias and to answer some of your questions. Um, so without further ado, I will introduce you to uh, Neil Rozon, who is a dementia care coach uh, at the Dementia Society of Ottawa and Renfrew County. And he will be our expert today, expertly answering all of your questions. Uh, related to dementia. So we absolutely want this to be an interactive session. So we would like that if you have any questions for Neil um, to type them in the chat box and we will get to the questions um, and, and get you some answers. Uh, you can ask your questions in English or French. We are bilingual and uh, we will, this will be a bilingual session. So we will be answering some questions in English and some in French as well. So to get us started, so we will be uh, asking questions or, or frequently asked questions um, that you get, Neil, um, when you interact with individuals living with dementia. So the biggest one, I guess, which we'll start off with, is what is dementia? Uh, thanks, Roxanne. So, so dementia really is an umbrella term that we use to describe a group of symptoms that occur when brain cells stop functioning you know, as they should. Um, symptoms vary from person to person. You know, no, no one really has quite the same uh, journey, but the symptoms will be similar uh, in some ways. And uh, we see mainly changes with cognition, right? So areas around memory, short-term memory, um, problems with thinking, with reasoning, and also with language, so communication, expressing themselves, finding the right word. Uh, we also see sometimes changes, dementia in behavior. So people will report changes in personality, uh, mood, mood changes, you know, rapid mood changes without really understanding why that is. Uh, and then even sometimes social skills. So interacting with others, being maybe more disinhibited or, or uh, acting out of character. You know, and then and then also physical functioning. So so change changes with with movement, uh, visual skills, coordination, balance. Uh, those are kind of the three elements that are common or present in dementia. Um, and it's actually really you know Ottawa. We have around 25, 24,000 people living with dementia. Uh, so a lot of people are are touched by dementia. And that will uh, only increase. We know that in the next decade, that those numbers will probably double. Thank you for this answer, Neil. So don't forget, everyone, if you have any questions, si vous avez des questions, n'hésitez pas à les écrire dans la chat box. So I guess one of uh, the next question that probably comes along often, Neil, is, is how does dementia progress? Um, yeah, and that's often a question we have eh, when, for people when they first call. It's like my, my parent, my family member's been diagnosed with dementia. What can I expect? How will this evolve? Uh, and normally we say, right, everyone's journey or everyone's experiences with dementia will be unique in their own way. Um, however, we, we present, you know, the progression as there will be different stages, right, that you can kind of expect and, and you will see changes happening in different stages. Um, and we kind of describe that in, in, we use like four different stages, right? We have the mild or the early stages, and that usually involves you know, symptoms like individuals having difficulty with finding words, uh, problems with communication, misplacing things. Um, you know, there are some some uh, changes with daily functions, but usually the person is able to, to function relatively well with some support, with some, some routines, 
with some uh, schedules, uh, but otherwise they're 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 managing right well in the mild stages. Um, in the middle stages, which is usually the the longest period, right? Dementia can um, you know they can be different depending on the type of dementia. But in the middle stages, um, we sometimes see more changes as far as um, um, personality or mood changes, you know, people kind of being more withdrawn, uh, more apathy, uh, sometimes a lack of interest in their personal care, you know, uh, some changes in that sense, and, and increased difficulty in communication. Not only are they just not finding the right word, but they're having more difficulty expressing their thoughts. And in the late stage of dementia, um, that's where we would normally see, you know, needing 24 hour kind of care. You know, the person really cannot be left alone because they're at risk of wandering or, or different, you know, safety concerns. Uh, they become less aware of their surroundings and the sense of time, you know, getting that kind of day night reversal um, and those kinds of challenging. And, and, and then at the last stage, in the end stages of dementia, that's where we will see people having difficulty, you know, eating. They're really, you know, it's feeding themselves. They're really needing 24 hour care, uh, difficulty with mobility. They might need some assistance with their transfers, getting in and out of a, a chair, out of bed, you know, and, and they really need full kind of 24 hour care. Uh, in the end stages, and they're more susceptible to infections and, 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 uh, you know, um, that sort of thing, yeah. Thanks, Neil. So we have a question from the audience. Um, so what officially deems you to be declared um, to have dementia? So diagnosing dementia is not um, a simple one step, one doctor's appointment kind of process. Usually it it's, uh, involves many different tests uh, with your, perhaps you start with your family doctor, then referred to a more specialized memory clinic. And from there, they will do different cognitive tests. Uh, we'll sometimes talk about the MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, uh, where the person with the symptoms will be asked questions, you know, and, and it's to, to, to test their, 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 their uh, cognition. Uh, they might get a test from a neurologist, brain scans, MRIs, a full workout of, you know, blood works, whatever. You're trying to rule out any um, reversible causes, you know, that is causing these changes in cognition. Uh, families or close family members are are also in this process because you're, we're also looking at, we talked about um, changes in day-to-day -day functioning and the ability to be, you know, living independently. So is the person still able to manage their finances, prepare a meal, um, you know, um, um, word finding, communication. Um, and that is all then put together to kind of determine, are there reversible causes? Is this delirium? Is this normal aging? Because sometimes as we age, we, we do kind of might have some slight cognitive changes, but it doesn't impact our ability to function day to day. And that is really what is the difference between normal aging and dementia is we see a uh, day to day functioning being impacted. You know, the person no longer what they used to be able to do now are, are maybe struggling or needing more and more support. So that's how we would look at dementias, to, you know, functions, day-to-day -day functions. And as a follow-up question, Neil, um, so having or having been diagnosed with dementia, does it have any impact someone, does it have any legal impacts? Um, so I'm, I'm guessing we're talking here about um, maybe driving and things like that. Yeah, so, so driving is always a, a, a sore or a sensitive topic uh, at these assessments because it's the doctor's uh, legal obligation to report any concerns he or she would have around 
uh, driving. So, and it's not necessarily just dementia, it could be for many different reasons, right? But uh, there are some, um, some of these assessments do look at driving, you know, and the ability to drive. And if there is any concern around that, that the doctor has a legal obligation to report to the ministry um, concerns about driving. And um, so, so in that sense, yes, there could be some legal repercussion around driving or, or around, you know, having dementia. Um, yeah, that's a good uh, point around uh, driving specifically. And is there any other impacts in terms of capacity that would have an impact legally? So capacity, well, you know, um, capacity is always assessed on, on, on whatever that specific issue is. You know, some people will say, well, my family member has dementia, does it mean, you know, I need to take over managing their finances or managing their personal care or, you know, uh, but, but, you know, in some situations, people live with dementia and can function and be part of decision making, you know, um, especially when it's related to their personal care. So, you know, the person always remains, we all remain, you know, independent and able to make those decisions unless otherwise uh, determined, right? So um, you can't kind of paint this on a, on it with a one, one, you know, broad paint and say, yeah, like you have dementia, you are no longer capable. It, it's case by case. It depends on the situation. And in and out, there's always that, um, um, option of getting a capacity assessment made, you know, so they're a trained professional that, that, that will evaluate capacity and determine if yes or no, uh, the person is able to make those decisions or not, you know, and that's where really the importance that we always mention is the importance of having uh, your power of attorneys, you know, and that's something we say early, well, everyone, dementia or not, you know, should have those kinds of planning in place where you, you name a substitute decision maker, someone you trust, you know, someone that could step in and make decisions on your behalf, if whatever reason you're no longer able to make those decisions, because your capacity has been, you know, impacted by dementia or, or anything else. Thank you. So another question from the audience is, who do you suggest that you call first uh, for an assessment? Mm -hmm. um, normally, I would I would recommend they connect with their family doctor, you know, could, because uh, depending on the family doctor's uh, comfort with dementia, right, they can start some just really simple in office kind of uh, tests just to kind of set a baseline or to determine next steps. You know, again, as I said, it could be something reversible. What if it's a medication side effect or is it uh, something on with uh, their thyroid being, you know, low th high, hyperthyroid, you know, uh, is it something uh, related to uh, mood, you know, where maybe depression can sometimes mimic dementia symptoms. So, so going to your family doctor, having initiating that conversation around concerns for memory, you know, and then from there, they can, as I say, look at ruling out different reversible possible causes, um, create a baseline, and then or, or refer to a more specialized memory clinic to, to, to further, you know, these uh, investigations. Okay, and another question, and this might be a little out of your, your expertise, Neil, but do we know if, um, so medical assistance in, in, in dying, it's legal in Canada now? Um, do we know? Um, my, again, this is from just my understanding, but uh, dementia is not really kind of, um, uh, how would I say, when someone has dementia, they, they are um, not, uh, how would I say, um, considered capable or... of making that decision. Again, we talked about capacity just earlier, you know, and having dementia, I'm not sure if that is deemed um, uh, a condition where someone might not qualify for made, you know, that medical assistance um, in dying. So, but we have a um, info sheet on our website around uh, made. 
So, and I think someone from the society could post that as follow-up or something, you know, or look at our website. But yeah, that that's kind of a, a very gray zone. We That comes up quite a bit eh, in our discussions with families sometimes is, you know, what can I do if I want to have more control and my future and, and that sort of thing, but yeah. Perfect. Yes. So I see that uh, uh, someone from the Dementia Society will post uh, in the chat box the link to um, the document you're referring to, Neil. So thank you. Great. So I realize I've been only asking questions in English, so we'll, we'll try one in French. Um, so a little bit about your role, Neil. So que fait un intervenant spécialisé en santé cognitive um, ou dans ton cas un Dementia Care Coach? Mm -hmm. Euh, ben nous, notre rôle comme intervenant euh, en santé cognitive à la Société de la démence, c'est euh, travailler hein, ensemble, c'est travailler en partenariat en, 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 avec la, soit la personne atteinte, hein, avec la démence ou leurs proches aidants, les membres de la famille, euh, d'essayer d'offrir de, 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 du soutien. Hein, le soutien, ça peut être... Euh, un à un, un soutien personnalisé euh, avec, euh, au téléphone. Euh, quand on peut, ça peut être en personne. Évidemment, la COVID a, a changé ça, mais ça peut être en personne, en, par téléphone, par Zoom. Euh, du soutien personnalisé pour, pour parler de leurs objectifs, hein, leurs défis, euh, de, de trouver des stratégies euh, qui peuvent aider à mieux vivre malgré le diagnostic de démence. Euh, ça peut être des services d'éducation aussi. Donc, d'offrir des renseignements, offrir des informations qui peuvent aider les gens à mieux comprendre les changements qu'ils vivent. Parce que des fois, les gens disent, est-ce que c'est normal? Est-ce que je peux m'attendre à quoi? L'évolution. Donc, on peut offrir des renseignements euh, pour aider à mieux comprendre, qui fait en sorte que la personne peut peut-être être mieux préparée euh, et mieux comprendre les changements. Euh, on a aussi euh, l'occasion de comment faire ça, de, de faire des référés aussi. Si jamais euh, la personne, par exemple, le répit des, du soutien à la maison, les gens souvent ne savent pas où, par où commencer. Donc, je trouve l'important, c'est d'avoir cette conversation-là. C'est une conversation, je dirais, qui est encore unique, euh, impersonnelle. Ce n'est pas une conversation qui s'applique à générique à tout le monde. C'est vraiment, OK, toi, ta situation, c'est quoi? Puis nous, comme intervenants, on essaie de déterminer les besoins, les objectifs, les stratégies qui sont pour toi. Puis euh, de déterminer euh, peut-être un plan. Puis ensuite, c'est de vous suivre hein, avec ce plan-là. Ce n'est pas juste une conversation. Souvent, c'est... Plusieurs conversations. On est ici pour, on est, on est ici dans votre cercle de soutien pour toute la durée, hein, pour tout le cheminement de, de le parcours. Donc c'est, c'est, euh, c'est de vous soutenir, de vous aider euh, avec les défis qui se présentent au jour le jour. And do you currently have a waitlist to access uh, support from a dementia care coach, or can people get in rather quickly? So no, that's really, uh, there's, anyone can call our, 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 um, our, our phone number, right? Uh, and there will be a dementia care coach there to answer your call. Uh, so I would say there is technically then no <laughs> wait list in that sense, right? Anyone can call, someone will answer the call and someone will be there to support you and have a conversation and you know, discuss your unique challenges. So, no, I would say there is <laughs> no That's wait wonderful. time in that sense. Wonderful. So another question from the audience. Uh, so why does it take on average for someone to see three to four neurologists in order to find competent, uh, to finally diagnose? So is the profession still in the dark ages, um, for example, still at the early stages of evolution? Family doctors are not qualified to diagnose dementia, such as conducting the MOCA test. So um, do you find that that's, um, neurology has evolved and, and is it more specific, is it becoming more specific to dementia and Alzheimer's disease? 
Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, like so, some family doctors uh, are, are, are general family, you know, practitioners and, and they might not know, you know, the, 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 you know, again, in diagnosing dementia is a very much a multidisciplinary, I think, uh, process. It's not just one visit to a family doctor. Uh, you come in and an hour later, here you go, here's what's going on and here's your diagnosis, right? It's, it's, it, it, it can take uh, multiple, you know, uh, visits to different specialists to try and figure out really what's going on here. Uh, it, it, if we could just simply do one blood test and that blood test can determine uh, or, you know, a, a throat swab and here you have a strep throat and here's your antibiotics and you're on your way, you know. Diagnosing dementia is, is much more complicated, and that's why sometimes uh, it, 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 it takes, it, it's over a span of, of many months, right, and many visits, uh, as I say, to try and rule out possible reversible cause and to really see then, because there are many forms of dementia as well. There's not just, you know, uh, one form of dementia, and, and there might be different um, reasons behind these changes in cognition or mood and and as we talked about earlier so you're trying to see you know what is behind this and and then what kind of treatment options are then um, available but but I guess there's always ongoing research and you know process as as far as diagnosing dementia um, so yeah it's it's an ongoing uh, process for sure um, so again, a question from the audience, so more specific, um, but I think we touched on it a little bit. So, so the first step to, to get an assessment would be to contact your family physician, right? Because they're the ones who can make the appropriate referrals. Um, would you say? You can, start, you can start with your family doctor. There's also the, uh, regional geriatric outreach team, and they have a team of nurses, social workers, you know, that, that that because uh, some people are hesitant or or they might not have a family doctor, you know, or some people, you know, sometimes people will say my mother just refuses to see her doctor. She hasn't been to a doctor in 20 years, you know, so you can always also reach out to the regional geriatric outreach team and you don't necessarily need a doctor's referral. You could call and explain, you know, the situation and they will send someone to your home to do that kind of initial um assessment again usually they it's not as if they'll walk in and say yep your mom has alzheimer disease you know but at least it's kind of that initial or that first step and then they can refer you then for follow-up let's say to a day hospital where a lot of these other tests will be done but sometimes it can provide that um comfort that the person is meeting that professional on their turf you know they're in their home uh they're inviting them to 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 uh, be in their home it's less uh, maybe intimidating so that can also be an option uh, if the family doctor route is not for whatever reason is not a good a good option there is that outreach team as well okay because i think one of the challenges has been of course with with covid and the restrictions um and difficulty at even accessing family uh, physicians um, Absolutely. Do you know the geriatric um, outreach team, they're still operating or do we know if they're? As far as I know, they were. I mean, now with the Omicron and the surge in cases, I think a lot of, I can't speak, you know, to that. Yeah. I'm not sure if they're, if, if uh, they've, if they're putting their home visits on hold or, or how that whole is, I'm not sure, you know, things have changed so much in the last couple of weeks say eh, with the omicron variant so i'm not even us at the society we used to we just slowly started to do in-person meetings but then we've had to put that again virtual because of of uh the surge in in numbers mm -hmm. and the, another part of the question was uh who can you ask if you have a file open but i guess that depends on the agency as well and and uh in terms of, of having dementia. Um, if you have a file open with us at the Dementia Society? Yeah, so maybe or? the person who asked the question, maybe if you wanna clarify, if, is it, if you're looking to find if you have a file open with the Dementia Society, um, 
was it refer in referral in reference to being referred to somebody? I'm not too sure. So, so perhaps um, that person, if you want to clarify in the chat in the chat box. Uh, if it's for us at the Dementia Society, uh, sometimes we'll see that right. Someone will call and say, "Well, I think I might have called, talked to someone in the past. It's been a while. I'm not sure." Again, just. Uh, call, you know, and, and if you are linked with a care coach, uh, we will, you know, make sure that you're reconnected, right? Your file will always be open uh, and will always be, you know, there to support you, even though it might have been a year or two since we've had a chat, right? Like the, 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 the door's always open in that sense. You know, your, your file would not be closed kind of idea. And I think that that's probably the case with a lot of agencies, right? They'll put your your file on hold and then, but the information still remains there and can be reopened um, usually at any time. Exactly. And if, and if somebody's struggling with those first steps to kind of, you know, what do I do? Do I, how do I seek an assessment? Would it be appropriate for them to reach out to a dementia care coach just to kind of help get that help to kind of know where to start? Well, yeah, absolutely, Roxanne. Uh, and that's oftentimes the calls we get, right? People will say, I think my mom has dementia, but I'm not sure. Like, you know, it, it, you don't need to connect with us after diagnosis. You know, we're there to support pre-diagnosis. Uh, we're there to promote brain health uh, strategies. Um, you know, anything around memory uh, concerns. Um, Definitely, because uh, dementia doesn't just happen overnight, right? Usually it happens or, or, or changes can start happening, you know, months, years, even before a diagnosis is made. So in that stage, there's often questions that family members might have. A is, I think mom's not quite, you know, changing or, or she's, you know, uh, so, so yes, to have that conversation early is I think a very good idea. It's all about um, getting access to services sooner and early to help prevent potential crisis down the road. You know, so you want to always be, as we say, like a step ahead. And, and that's where that can come in. It's just having that early conversation and, you know, um, provide you with that support early on versus when there is a crisis and then you know, um, you're you're scrambling to 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 set up some some supports. Well said, well said. I think that, like you said, early support uh, is always better. Um, and I know that uh, the Champlain Community Support Network we have. Um, an online platform um, that can connect individuals uh, living with dementia or not, but uh, individual seniors living in their community to get them connected with um, community support services. So really services that can support any individual, no matter the deficit, to um, live, live and remain at home healthy um, and safely for as long as possible. So you can always visit our website, Community Home Support. Um, somebody will post it in the chat box for you, uh, but really, you know, you can get in touch and in contact with different support services, whether it be adult day programs, which we know um, is really beneficial and, you know, there are wait times and there's COVID and there's a lot of, of um, barriers at this time. So again, the, you know, the earliest you can look into those um, support services, I think the, the better, you know, Meals on Wheels, anything to help support and I think um, uh, take off a little bit from the caregivers, um, I think is, is really important. So there's different services out there. And I know that all the dementia care coaches are super great at helping um, individuals navigate that and make the appropriate referrals. So, so it's not, um, you know, there's, there's all the support, the education around dementia, but there's so much more that can impact the day-to-day -day life. So there is, you know, a lot of different services out there um, to help support that. Yeah, no, that's well said, uh, Roxanne, because uh, as we talked earlier with, you know, 24,000 people in Ottawa living with dementia, there's still a lot of 
uh, stereotypes and mis, you know, information and stigma around dementia. And, you know, we have, we, we hear the word dementia and, and we think of people living in care facilities or in long-term care, but the vast, vast majority of people living with dementia are living in our community, our neighbors, our, 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 our family members. And it's exactly right to connect them with those community resources to ensure that they can stay in their homes and part of the community for as long as possible, eh? Absolutely, that's that's where people thrive, right? And and we've seen the research and uh, and um, yeah, absolutely. So I'm being mindful of the time. Um, so if anybody else has any burning questions, um, feel free to type them in the chat box uh, right now. If not, if you think of questions further down the road after our session, um, don't hesitate to reach out directly to the Dementia Society. I'm sure that the contact information will be posted in the chat box. Um, because, you know, after the lunch and learn, questions might, you know, start brewing. So um, they're there absolutely to answer your question. So here's another one uh, from the audience. So how do you know if you have oh, a social worker? So that would be through home and community care, I would, I would think. Um, yeah, if this is uh, the Champlain home and community care, um, again, by calling. You know, you, you the person on the uh, phone would would easily look up your information and determine. You know, if you have a contact at the Champlain Home and Community Care, um, if not, they would transfer your call to intake, and then from there they will, you know, take some basic information and and you know set you up with a follow up call. You know, to 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 do an assessment, whether it's at home, whether it's on the phone. I'm, that I'm not sure, but but yeah, again, it's just uh, you can call yourself. You know, you don't need to have your doctor do this for you. Um, just call the Champlain Home and Community Care and ask, do I have someone uh, there? Do I have a file open? Again, you might have had a file open two years ago, whatever. Um, you forget who that person was, <laughs> your contact person, people come and go. You know, but but ultimately, as Roxanne said, they will have a record of that. So just they can give you that uh, information by just simply calling. And and I know that so it's now a home and community care, uh, home and community support services Champlain, yes. which was formerly the Lynn, which was yes. formerly CCAC. So you know, it, it is hard to navigate for us as professionals. I know, uh, you know, especially when names change and you have different professionals and in touch with different agencies. So um, you know, I know that you guys are always on top of it, knowing the partnering agencies. Uh, so yes, home and community support services Champlain uh, are the ones I believe that. Um, are the kind of entryway to a lot of support in the home, especially when it comes to personal support, long-term long care admissions, um, applications to adult day programs. So absolutely, um, they have a website as well. Um, so um, we'll put that in the chat box as well, the Home and Community Support Services Champlain uh, website. Mm -hmm. Any last questions? I think one that uh, is frequently asked that I have here on our list is what's the, and, and probably a good one to wrap up the session and, and to close off for, for um, the January Alzheimer's Awareness Month is what's the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we uh, get that a lot. And that is part of our education, um, as you say, component, right, to our services. And we, we do have a lot of, uh, um, education uh, offerings that explains that. Um, a great way just to plug in is, is our, our Dementia Society has a YouTube uh, channel as well. So if you go on YouTube and you, 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 you can click, there's lots of uh, videos that we've uh, recorded on, on the, you know, uh, this, this subject. But, but essentially, you know, the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease is that dementia is that umbrella term that we use to describe changes, as we talked earlier, changes around cognition, changes around, you know, um, the ability to, to function on a day-to-day -day basis, changes with behavior, 
you know, so, so that dementia is, is kind of a general umbrella term and Alzheimer disease is, falls under of one type of dementia. And it is probably the most common form of dementia. Um, and and um, it's, it's, it's seen, uh, you know, more commonly in, in people 65 and older. Um, but there are many other forms of dementia you might have heard of, you know, vascular dementia, you know, when there's a blood flow or, or blood vessel changes in the brain is like more of a vascular dementia, dementia from Lewy bodies, frontal temporal dementia. And then we often hear of mixed dementia. So, so there, you know, some, some individuals have vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease, you know, kind of acting at the same time. Uh, but essentially, you know, uh, dementia is again, like I say, that umbrella term, Alzheimer's disease is a, a, a type of dementia. Um, so it's, it's, um, that's the kind of the, I would describe, describe that, that, that difference. Well explained, well explained. Um, so I don't see any other questions coming up. So I'm hoping that we've, we've been able to answer um, all of your questions. Don't hesitate to reach out to the Dementia Society if you have further questions. Uh, visit their website. They have all, you guys have all kinds of resources and tip sheets and all that. Um, so absolutely a great um, a point as well of, of reference to start off. Um, and like I've mentioned, so the Champlain Community Support Network has um, their CareDove site, so communityhomesupport.ca, uh, where you can find other additional community support services um, in your community. So it was great chatting with you today, Neil. And thank you for all the great work and all of the support that, that the Dementia Society provides to, to folks living with dementia and their loved ones. So. Thank you, everyone.